wanted us this morning as a church body to pray for him. What he's doing is amazing, and I was explaining it to my own son. When you start an orphanage and it's your baby and you're doing it, I said, when you're gone, who does it? And so let's pray for that family, and some of you guys know that family. And so as we begin this morning, if you'll bow your heads, I'll open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come into your house this morning to worship together, to uh, praise you together. I pray, Heavenly Father, this morning, especially for uh, Johnny Touche as he's uh, battling this heart attack that he had and he's in bad shape. I pray that you would be there with him in a very special way, as truthfully only that you can, that you would comfort his heart, that you would give him strength as he's trying to heal. I pray for his family as they're concerned about him and his friends. I pray that you would walk with them as well and comfort them. And I just pray that just as your hand would be on this situation and your will would be done. And I pray as we go through this service that even in the songs we'd be reminded of how good and how wonderful you are and how powerful and your ability to be in these situations and help. I pray that that would be on display. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing Seek Ye First. Verse 6 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided. And all those things are those things that we worry about, right? Are we going to eat? Are we going to get a good night's sleep? Are we going to have shelter over our heads? But if we truly seek the Lord first, he will provide those things for us. And Psalm 12, or Psalm 126 says, the Lord has done great things for us and we are joyful. So to God be the glory.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all the things that you've done for us, both seen and unseen. I thank you for allowing us to come into your house today, dear God, and to lift your name up in praise. And let us not forget that your name is the sweetest that there has ever been, and that when we are in times of trouble, that we should run to you as our shelter. We thank you, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you could begin to turn to Ephesians 4. The passage that we're going to be in this morning is in Ephesians 4. And actually, most every uh, verse that we come to today is in Ephesians 4. So if you want to take your Bible and kind of get it open really good, that's where we're going to be and stay. As most of you guys have probably noticed, I'm not Bobby. He, uh, there was a friend of his that asked him to speak at a special service. And he wanted to be kind to his friend and do that for him since they had uh, asked him to do that. And he asked if I'd take uh, his spot this Sunday. And I'll tell you, I love to share God's word. I was glad for the invite. I was glad to be asked because I, I love to take God's word and to share it and explain it, hopefully good Lord willing, in a way that is very useful and very helpful to people. The last couple Sundays I've been here, I just got off third before I, before I came here, so I was a little foggy so this whole week I said I cannot work third at all so when I get here I'll have clear vision because if you wonder what it's like to work third and come to church 
If you have glasses, blow hot air on them where it gets real foggy and put them on and walk around. That's what third shift feels like, and that's what I've been doing for the past couple weeks. Before we begin, I'd like to go ahead and pray and ask that God would bless this service, and then, uh, then we'll get into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share from your word today. I pray, Holy Father, that as I proclaim your word, that your Holy Spirit would go out and that it would touch hearts. And as your word is proclaimed, that the Holy Spirit would just personalize it and say, this is for you. This is what you need. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill me and I would say nothing more and nothing less than what you'd have me to say. And I pray in everything that's done today in this message and in the music, that we would glorify you and we would be encouraged to honor you in the way that we live. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The goal for this morning's message is I want to encourage you, as you live out your life as a Christian, to be a positive example of Jesus to the world. And to show you what I mean, growing up, a lot of what I was taught about Christ and especially about Christianity, was from a negative perspective. It was, don't do this, don't do that. Christians don't do this. Christians don't say that. And when you look at Christ and Christianity from just that, just a negative perspective, it leaves a huge void in your life. And, and to explain what I mean, imagine this is my mind. When I was growing up, I had a lot of ideas of who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, and it felt like, and it seemed like, every time I would go to church, the pastor would say, well, a Christian doesn't do this. Ooh, I don't even know what, a, what this is, but a Christian shouldn't do that. Uh, Christians shouldn't say this, and Christians shouldn't say that. And it felt like, even in Sunday school, a Christian doesn't do this. And it got to the point, an actual time in my life, where I was wondering, well, well, what should a Christian do? What could a Christian do? And I want to speak to that this morning. I want to show you Christ and Christianity from a positive perspective. I want to show you things that Jesus did and things that Jesus says we as Christians should do. Not to be more negative and take more things out of the bowl in your mind, but to put things in. And I want to encourage you through these things that we look at to do these things, to be about these things, to be a positive example of Jesus to the world, to your world, your sphere of influence. You see, you guys see different people than I do. When I go to work, I see different people than you see. When I go home, I see different people than you see. You have a whole different sphere of influence than I have, and I want to encourage you to show the people that you deal with, this is who Christ is. This is what Christianity is about by your life because the world needs a positive example. The world now more than ever, if you watch the news, needs to see Christ. They need to see hope. I think of a, a guy I used to work for a couple years ago in Seneca. He owned a business where he would take homes that were foreclosed on or they were abandoned. He would buy them from the city and he would flip them. And my job working for this guy was I was his demolition guy. He would come into a home and he would say, I want that wall gone, I want the floors taken up, I want all the sheetrock off, or I want all the electric out. And my job was to make it disappear. And other people would come in and fix it back the way it was supposed to be, but my spiritual gift was destruction and I used it. I tore every house he had up. But on this particular house that I, that I, I was gonna mention because it fits the service, on this particular house, we go in, there's too much trash. There's trash everywhere. He said, I can't even tell you what to do. He said, what I need you to do first is get all the trash out, and then we'll kind of look at the bones and see what we have to do. And as I'm going through this house, and as I would do this job, you start to realize who lived there, and you start to understand who lived there and what they were about and the type of family that lived there. And so as I'm cleaning out this house, I'm in the parents' room, and I start to see drug paraphernalia. Prior to this, I, I worked for a police department. I knew what I was looking at, and it was meth paraphernalia. And if you don't know anything about meth, meth messes with your mind and makes you think things that are not happening are happening. It messes with your body to where you don't walk like this and you don't talk like this. You have very scary and strange movements. And so I realized that's probably why the house looks the way it 
because people that did meth live here. And so as I'm going through the house, the very next room over is where their kids lived. It was pink. Everything was pink. The curtains, the beds, the bed covers. And there was little dolls, and there was little dresses and little shoes. And it broke my heart to think that literally one wall separated people doing meth from these poor little kids. And as I cleaned the house more, I found their picture on the fridge. And I saved that picture because, guys, as a police officer, when I go out and I see people on meth, they scare me. So I can't even imagine being a young child, and it was a kid about my daughter's age and about my little son's age, to live next to that. It would be so scary, and I saved that picture because I think a lot of times we as Christians, we get in our own little bubble, and we think the world is as we see it. We think everybody lives the life that we do, but some people live in very horrible situations, and they need hope. They need to see God's love on display. They need to see that there is another way of life, another way of living. They need a positive example of doing and being. And we as Christians, we can do that. We can show people and be a light and show light to a dark world. And we can change our world. Jesus changed the world. If you read your Bible and you start from the beginning and you go to the end, God created everything. It was beautiful. It was good. He said so. And then people of their own choice started to do bad things. And I mean, you ain't a couple chapters in, and they're already starting to kill each other. And you watch as it deteriorates and deteriorates, and people are being horrible. And then all of a sudden, God, closer to the middle of the Bible, says, I'm going to send somebody that's going to help you. And he's called literally a deliverer from the trajectory that they were on, and that deliverer right in the middle of the Bible you find out is Jesus Christ. And when Jesus shows up on scene, all of a sudden everything starts. It was a downfall to traject up, and Jesus did that. And we as Christians can do that by living the way that Jesus lived. We can change our world for the better. And what's interesting about the main passage that we're going to look at in Ephesians 4 is God says... We need to do that. He says, if you're a Christian and you have Christ in your life, there are certain things that you won't do, but there are things that you need to do, that you need to be about, that the world needs to see. And I want you to pay attention as we look at each one of these passages. As the Bible, God takes things out, he will immediately, he doesn't leave a void, but he'll immediately start putting things back in. And what we look at in Ephesians, you'll also notice Jesus did exactly what we're being asked to do. And so what's the first thing that you can do, that you can be about as a Christian that's very different from the norm? And the first thing I want us to notice is you can do good for others. You can be a giver. Jesus was all about doing good, about giving, about serving others. He gave of his abilities. As the son of God, he had the ability to heal. And you see many times in scripture where he finds people that are hurt, that are sick, that are wounded, and he meets them and he heals them. He was giving of his time. You see him go out of his way, Jesus Christ, go out of his way many times to eat with different people, to sit with, down with people, to talk with people. He was giving of his possessions. Two times in scripture it records that Jesus fed thousands. And one time he fed 5,000. And in that time they used a little boy's lunch and Jesus performed a miracle and fed 5,000. But the second time he fed 4,000. Both are recorded in, in Mark. And in that second time when he reads the 4,000, if you read it, you know what he fed them with? Him and his disciples lunch. They were going to send all these people away because they knew they were hungry. And the disciples says, we should let them go so they can go eat. And Jesus says, well, what do we got? And they told him what they had. And he said, let's feed them that. And ultimately, just showing how much of a giver Jesus was, he gave his life. The Bible says, greater love, you will not find a greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And Jesus considers you a friend. He considers me a friend. He gave his life for us. Because the Bible says, one day, every single one of us will stand before God and we will give an account of our life. And the Bible says, when we do, the, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has done wrong. And when we stand before God, it would be in our sins. And the Bible says the wages or the payment for that sin 
is death. That's what should happen when we stand before God. But then the Bible says, but God commends or shows his love towards you and towards me in that while we were yet sinners, even though we had sin, Jesus Christ died to pay that that death penalty. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died and gave his life for us. Jesus was a giver. And that's something that as a Christian, we should be about. The Bible says in Philippians 2, it says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what that's saying is you shouldn't just look out for you, all you, all the time, what's best for me, The Bible says you should look out for other people. What do they need? Start looking for those needs because that's how Jesus thought and that's how we should think. And in our passage, Ephesians 4.28, Ephesians 4.28 says this, and I love how it says it. It says, let him that stole steal no more. So if you're a Christian and you used to steal, the Bible says, yeah, you should get that out of your life. If you're stealing That needs to come out of your life. You should not steal. But here's what I want you to do. And now he's putting things in. He says, but rather, Christian, labor, work with your hands the thing which is good that you may have to give to him that needeth. And so what God is saying is don't steal. What I want you to do is I want you to work hard. And so if there's a need and you see a need, you will have enough resources left over that you could help that need. And the Bible says in Proverbs 21, it says the righteous gives without sparing. In our world, people steal. Kids steal from their parents. Employees steal from their employers. I worked at a job where you could write down the time that you came in and write down the time that you leave. And I watched many people come in at 7, right? They had been there at 6, leave at 3, right? They had left at 5. People do that. People in general Look out for number one at the expense of whoever. But God is encouraging Christians not to just be about number one, but rather be hard workers. And don't just earn a bunch of money to get yourself nice things or spend all of your money on you, but work hard so you can have some money left over so you can bless others. And this happened to me one time. I used to work for a guy in landscaping. And this happened about 20 years ago, and actually more than 20 years ago now. And just as I'm going to tell you this story, I want to show you something so that you'll have your mind wrapped around the story. If I was to stand like this, and I was to pull my pant legs up, you would think I was... I have, I have very little legs. They're very skinny. You wouldn't even see them behind these two things. And if I was to pull my pant legs up, immediately some of you guys would start to think I was hungry, and you would be encouraged to possibly feed me. Well, about 20 years ago... I worked for this guy in landscaping, and he would let us go out, and he would let us eat eat out after we had worked hard for him. And on this particular occasion, it was in Greenville. I went to the Burger King that's next to the hospital. And when I get to the Burger King, I was wearing shorts. I had weed-eated all day. I was extremely dirty. My legs are out. I look very hungry. And so I get to the Burger King, and I realize I didn't bring my wallet. I have money to buy food. I just didn't have money with me to buy food. And so I was driving a 72 bug at the time, and I pull my ashtray out, and I have coins, enough to get myself a hamburger and a free water. And so I go into the Burger King, and I dump my little thing when I got up there, and I dump it out on the thing. And my hands are dirty, I'm dirty, I'm skinny, and I'm dumping change out. And I pick the cheapest burger on the menu in a water. Well, as I'm doing this, a lady behind me, I didn't even know this was happening, but she notices probably seen my legs, and she's like, this boy's hungry, and so she takes money, cash money, scoots by me in my way, and slaps it on the thing, and she says, you get this boy whatever he needs, whatever he wants to eat, if he wants another burger, if he wants fries, I want you to get it for him, and I got to tell you guys, that meant a lot to me, I had money, I just didn't have it with me, and yeah, I actually was hungry, but it meant so much to me that 20 plus years since it happened, I can remember that happening, and I can remember what it meant to me. Giving does that. Giving softens hearts. I think a man of a family in my church, when I was a pastor in Kentucky, every Wednesday we would do 
prayer requests. And this family, the, the mom would always say, pray for my brother. He's not a Christian, and he actually had a disease that was going to end his life. And she says, I'm concerned for his salvation. Every time we try to talk to him about God, he won't listen, and he'll shut you down, and he'll say he doesn't want to hear it. Well, over the course of praying for him for Wednesdays, it got worse. And, and, and on one Wednesday, she said, can you pray for my brother? His wife has left him. because I mean, his, uh, he lost his job because of his inability to make it to work all the time because of the disease. The job cut him loose. And then a couple weeks later, and I said it earlier, but his wife left him. She said his wife left him because he ain't got no job. And she took his kids. And then a couple weeks later, she's like, can you, she said, y'all please pray for him. He's absolutely lost hope because he lost, he's about to lose his life. He lost his job. He lost his wife. He lost his kids. And after that service, and after we prayed for him, the family came up and they said, Pastor, we were wondering if you would be willing to go and speak to my brother. I don't think he's got much time. We've tried. We don't, we don't know what else to say. He won't listen to us. Would you go and speak to my brother? And if you're a pastor worth anything, you're going to say yes. That's what we do. That's what we're called to do. But y'all don't know me, but I'm very shy. I don't feel comfortable talking to anybody about anything other than when God allows me an opportunity to preach. And so if you had come to me and said, Michael, I have a brother. He asked for a pastor. He wants somebody to come tell him about God. Would you go tell him? I would have genuinely been nervous and be like, okay, I, I think I can do it. Let me muster up some courage. But that's not how that was presented. It was presented as, Michael, would you go visit my brother? He doesn't know you're coming. He doesn't know who you are. And he certainly doesn't want you to tell him anything about God. And so I was legit scared, but I said I would do it. And from the time they asked me to the time I went, I prayed earnestly, God, I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to start a conversation like that. God, what should I say? And all the way up to the time I left, get in the car, turn on the keys, head that way, because he lived a couple hours away. Never did God give me anything to say. But God did burden my heart about the fact he didn't have a job. And so God burdened my heart to get some money together, to take him some money. And so when I went up to his house, I had an envelope of money. I knocked on the door. I said, I know you don't know who I am. I'm the pastor of Mount Roberts. Your family goes there. I want you to know that God knows you have a need and God loves you. And I handed him the envelope. And when I handed him the envelope, he immediately began to cry. We hugged. We talked. We talked for a long time. But I share that because it was through a gift that I was able to have a meaningful conversation with him. He had a need. People have needs. But we can never meet people's needs if we spend all of our resources on ourselves. And I'll say that one more time. You can never meet other people's needs if you spend all of your resources on yourself. You can say you care a thousand times. You can even say it with puppy dog eyes, but giving shows that you care because most people, they love their money, they love their time, they love their resources. But when you say, I don't love money, I don't love time or resources, I love you, it softens a heart and giving does that. Giving shows them, it shows them that you mean more to me than this silly old money that most people would do anything to get. You're worth my time, you're my abilities, my effort, my resources. And Jesus showed that. He showed he didn't care about possessions or things, but about people and souls. And he did that by giving. He gave his time, his money, his life. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is tough because stingy is what comes natural. Giving is a God thing. But you'd be amazed at the doors and opportunities that will open if you are a giver. And just practically speaking, something God burdened my heart to do, if you go to my truck right now, there's cash in the glove box. Please don't rob me after church. But uh, there's cash in my glove box. And that cash is not for if I run out of gas. It's not for if I forgot money for food. One thing that happens when you see people in need, a lot of times, me now, I carry no cash. And so I'm thinking, ah, I wish I could help them. And then I think, well, if I went to the bank, probably by the time I got the money and came back, they won't even be here. So God burdened my heart to be more prepared. And so it's in there. I don't know who it's for. But when God presents that opportunity, it's already there. No excuses. It's for them. And I would encourage you to think of ways that you could 
be a giver as well. The second thing that you can do, that you can be about, that's very different from the norm, and we're going to look at just three. But the second thing is you can speak kindly. You can be an encourager. Jesus was a major encourager. If you look at the story in John 8 of the woman that was caught in adultery, they bring this lady into the synagogue where Jesus is teaching. It would essentially be kind of like this. Somebody's preaching. They bring a girl caught in adultery into the church, and they're demanding justice. And they come to Jesus, and they say, we caught her in adultery. The law says to stone her, throw rocks at her until she's dead. What do you say? And they said this twice to Jesus. And Jesus tells them, let him without sin cast the first stone. And they all leave. And I love what Jesus says to the girl. He stands up and he says, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none. He says, neither do I condemn you. And then he says, go and sin no more. And what Jesus was essentially telling this girl is, I know you came in as an adulterer. And they should have had two people come in because it takes two. But he, she, he said, I know you came in an adulterer, but you can do differently. I know you can. I know that you can do this. And he sends her out. He says, go and sin no more. I think of Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He had some, done some nefarious things where he's taking more taxes than he should, and he's stealing from the people. Well, when Jesus comes through his town, Zacchaeus is up in a tree because he wants to see who Jesus is as he goes by. Jesus stops at the tree, and he says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, Come down, because I'm going to your house today. And what Jesus was essentially saying to Zacchaeus is, Tax man, I know not too many people like you, but I care about you, and I want to spend time with you. To the woman at the well, he says, Let me tell you something wonderful that will change your life. To Peter, after the resurrection, this is the perfect example of Jesus being an encourager. Jesus, when he was taken to trial and in the end crucified, at that moment in time, he sure could have used a friend. And Peter was his friend at that time. But when that was all going down and taking place, Peter denied even knowing Jesus Christ. I don't even know this man. I don't even know who you're talking about. I'm not with him. And Peter, because he denied Jesus in his darkest hour, was absolutely destroyed. He went back to the job that he did before he was following Jesus Christ, as any of us would if we let our friend down at just, a, just the occasion that they would need us the most. But Peter goes back to fishing. Well, Jesus, when he resurrects from the dead, he goes to Peter specifically in John 21, and he tells Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes. He says, feed my sheep. And he says this three times. And what he's essentially saying to Peter is, I know that you've messed up, but I still believe in you. I told you I wanted you to share the gospel. I still want you to do that. That's Jesus Christ. He was an encourager. In Ephesians 4.29, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians 4.29, here's what it tells Christians. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. If you are somebody, corrupt is kind of like rust. You've got a perfectly good piece of metal. Rust gets on it, and over time, the metal's useless. If what comes out of your mouth tears people down and to the point where they're useless, the Bible says if that's you as a Christian, yeah, you should take that out. That's not something you should do. But then he immediately replaces it with something else. He says, but use your mouth to that which is good, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Instead of tearing things down, edifying is almost like you put metal on metal. You're making it stronger. And I love how he says that it may minister grace. Grace in the Bible is getting what you don't deserve. And so God is telling Christians, the person you're speaking to may not have earned you saying anything nice to them. That don't matter. Say it anyway. It doesn't matter. Minister grace to the hearer. People in general are very critical. I myself am very critical by my human nature. Michael, if left to himself with no Holy Spirit guidance, am very critical. And most people are. And people most all day are being verbally, they're being tore down. Parents by their kids. Kids by their parents. Bosses by the workers. Workers by the bosses. Friends are tearing each other down. People are being made fun of, harassed belittled and over time that has a very devastating corrupting effect on people and it in turn causes those people that were criticized to be critical it's a vicious cycle but as a practicing 
Christian. And what I mean by practicing is you're doing what Jesus did. You can break that cycle. And in fact, you can get it flowing in the other direction. And I want to encourage you to do that, to be that man or woman. When you're going to work, when you're going home, when you're going to church, when you're going to school, that you think of who's going to be there when you get there. And you ask God, what could I do or what could I say that would lift these people up? And when you do this, if you would make that determination to be like Jesus, it can change your work, it can change your family, it can change your church, and it can start with you. Even if you're at the bottom of the totem pole, I think of when I was in youth group a long time ago. When I was in youth group, we were not good kids. We were not kind to the youth leader. We were not good kids in our church youth group. We were very mean. And I remember they brought in a new leader and his wife. And that new leader and his wife wanted us as a youth group to start singing. They felt like that would be good for us to sing praises to God. And it is good. But they would come in and they would sing. And we refused to sing. And they would sing every week and sing all the songs they were going to sing. We wouldn't say anything. Well, there was a girl that came into our youth group. Her dad was in the Air Force, and it just happened to put him next to our church. And when she came in, she determined, I'm going to encourage these people. They started singing. She started singing. And so for a couple weeks, it was them and her. Well, then she started to make friends in the youth group, got her friends singing. And eventually, it got to the point where in my youth group, we were all singing. We had our songs picked out. We would show up early, and we'd be like, can we sing this song? And we sing that song. And guys, it was because of one person determining, no, I'm not following. Everybody's being this horrible way. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be encouraging. And she changed our youth group. Jesus spoke kindly and was very encouraging, and he changed the course of people's lives. They would be ready to just explode with passion and love after he spoke to him. If you think about the woman at the well, he speaks to her, he spends time with her, which just shook her. And she goes out and she shares the gospel. Many people are saved. You think of Zacchaeus. Jesus said, I'm going to spend time with you. I care about you. His feet are barely on the ground. And he's like, I'm gonna be a different person. If I've robbed people, I'm gonna repay up to four times what I've done to them. And Peter, I think the perfect example, Jesus comes to him and Jesus says, do you love me? Yes. He says, feed my sheep. That's John 21. And you know what comes after John 21? Acts. And in the first couple chapters of Acts, what happens? Peter, just absolutely encouraged by God, drops fishing again, begins to preach. And it says thousands of people are saved. And I want to encourage you to be like Jesus, to to be encouraging and pray and ask God to help you to be encouraging. And I know it's tough because being critical is what comes natural. Encouraging is a God thing. But when you're this way, if you're encouraging, maybe somebody's day is horrible at home or horrible at work or they had a horrible day at school. But when they meet you, all of a sudden, just like when Jesus showed up, the trajectory was down all of a sudden it starts to go up once they met Jesus Christ. And it's the same way. Their, their day is trajectorying down. They meet you and all of a sudden, boop, it starts coming up. That's the way it should be. That's the way it was with Jesus and that's the way it should be when people meet us. And so the last thing, the first was that we would, uh, the, the, the first was that we would be givers. The second would be that we'd be encouraging. But the last thing that we're gonna look at from Ephesians the last thing you can do or be about that's very different from the norm, it's a different way of life, is you can be peaceful, you can be a peacemaker. Jesus was a peacemaker. And so if you're wondering what a peacemaker is, imagine an oven, and there are situations in life where it's like the oven, the, the, the burners are up on high. A peacemaker will come into a very hot situation and they will turn the burner down. That's what Jesus does. Just that woman caught in adultery, if you remember, they bring her in, and they are going to stone her. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where people want to kill people, but it's intense, extremely intense. So they come in to Jesus, and they said, the Bible, the, the, the law says we're supposed to stone her. What do you say? And he begins to write on the ground. And so they get more intense. They said, the law says you're supposed to stone her. What do you say? And Jesus says something that changes everybody's attitude. He says, let him without sin cast the first stone. And they went out from the oldest to the youngest, and they left. 
Jesus brought peace. If you think of Mark 4, when Jesus was with his disciples in a boat and the storm was raging, the disciples thought, we are absolutely going to die in this storm. Jesus gets up and he tells the wind and the waves, peace, be still, and it calms down. And in John 18, when they came to get Jesus for his trial and ultimately to crucify him, the Bible says verbatim, it says they came with torches and weapons. It was mob mentality and things were getting out of hand. And Jesus speaks. And what does Jesus say? He says, if you seek me, let these go their way. And it calms down. He says, you're here for me. I'm here. I'm going to go with you. But let all the people with me go their way. He brought peace. Jesus was all about peace. And in fact, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, the Spirit of God is going to encourage you to be a peaceful person, to encourage peace. It says in Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And that's how you're going to know you're dealing with a child of God. Are they turning it up or are they turning it down? And in Romans 12, it says, Recompense no man evil for evil, Christian. Don't do that to people. If they're evil to you, don't bring evil back. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, I want you, Christian, to live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. God says, you have my word on it. If someone's done you wrong, I don't want you to go out and fix it. I'll take care of it, God says. You're a child of mine. You're a Christian. If they've done you wrong, I didn't forget. It wasn't unnoticed. I'll take care of it. I want you to just be good and to be peaceful. And in Ephesians 4, our passage, this is what it says. Christian, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor or brawling and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice or all evil intentions. If you're somebody that's angry all the time, if you're somebody that has evil intentions, if you're somebody who uses uh, just angry language, the Bible says, yeah, Christian, take that out of your life. That should not be in there. And then he puts something back in. He says, and be kind. This is what I'd rather you do. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. He says, I want you to be peaceful because just like it says in James 1.20, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. What that's saying is when you take matters into your own hands, and I've heard people do this so many times and they'll use their last name when they're about to do something really horrible. They'll say, you know what? I've been good and I've tried not to deal with this myself, but they're about to see what a tickner is all about, or whatever your last name is. That's when you know it doesn't matter what the Bible says. They're going to do the opposite, and they're going to do whatever they want. But God says, you can guarantee my word on it. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There's not anything good coming from you doing that. And the, the story that I think of that, that uh, I think speaks to this is when I was... First, a police officer. I was a police officer in Liberty. And this is, I think, back in 2005 or 2006. But I was supposed to ride with a person who was supposed to show me how a police officer is supposed to act and how to respond. One of my first calls, and as I was recalling the story, I was trying to think, was it my first or my first week working? It was one of the two, but one of the first calls I ever got as a police officer was baby got shot. That's exactly how it came across the radio uh, Officer so-and-so and and officer so-and-so, you need to report to such-and-such a road in Liberty, a baby has been shot. And so we go racing to this call. We actually beat the ambulance. And I'm just going to go ahead and share the story so you kind of can relax just a little bit. What actually happened is there's a boy on this particular road that the baby was on. He is up at least four houses on the opposite side of the road, and he's shooting plastic jugs with a BB gun in his yard. And if, you, if your BB gun doesn't have a lot of power, it bounces off the jug. And so supposedly what happened is he shoots a jug, it bounces off, and somehow goes down the road a couple houses. And as the baby is on the front porch, the BB blink, plinks the baby, and the baby cries, supposedly. The baby wasn't crying when we got there. And so they're almost holding the baby up to the light to show you where this thing hit because I'm thinking baby got shot I'm expecting blood or something but they're like yeah it got hit here and the wife's like no it didn't get hit there it got hit here 
So anyway, that's what happened. But the person that was with me that was showing me how we're supposed to do things, all he heard was baby got shot. That is it, and that's all that went. And so we raced to the scene, and when we get there, he gets out of his car, and if we were on the show, cops, it'd have sounded just like a car alarm. Beep, 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 beep. He is angry, he's upset, and he says, where is he? And they point up, to the, ro up the road, and so I'm walking with him, and we go up the road, and he beats on the door. It's like... And the grandpa opens the door, and the grandpa says, what? He says, where is he? He says, he's in here. He said, send him out. He said, I'm not sending him out, and I wouldn't have either. He says, you send him out or we're coming in. So the grandpa reluctantly sends his boy out, and it ends up being about my son Toby's age. And so the police officer's given him the business for shooting a baby. And that, he keeps using that terminology for shooting a baby. And he takes him down to the car, and he sticks him in the car well, while all this is happening. We hear screeching, it's car tires, and down the street comes a truck with guys, I mean, hanging out the windows, it's like something you would see on television. They've got sticks, they've got clubs, golf clubs, they've got everything because a baby's been shot, the parents have called everybody, so they come zipping down the street, and when they come around the corner, another car full of people, weapons, all sorts, come around, and I mean, they get there, and they're like, where is he? Then the police officer opens the door and, he's, and he yells to the kid, he said, I ought to let him have you, and slams the door. The Bible says, if you're a Christian, don't do that. Absolutely, don't be that person that would take an already bad situation and stir it up. That's not what a Christian should be. We should be peacemakers. We should be calm. We should be the ones that bring the calm. And practically speaking, how do we do this? In James 1, 19, where in the, pre, in the post verse it says, the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. It says, Christian, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. If you want to be a peacemaker, one of the best things you can do, because the positive emphasis here is on listening, is being a listener. Most people, when they're losing their cool and taking situations and turning them up, have heard one side and they run with it. But the Bible says as a Christian, you need to listen, because when you get two sides, your advice is a ton better when you've heard the full story. And so be a listener, but also practically speaking, it says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Christian, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says, don't take any situation for granted. If you're going to a situation, whatever that happens to be, pray and talk to God and say, God, how should I handle this situation? God, help me to be a listener in this situation. And when you do that, God will help you to be calm in those situations and bring peace to those situations. And I don't know if it was because of my first week of training, but that's what I did as a police officer. If I'm going to a horrible situation, I would pray and say, God, I don't know what's exactly happening, but when I get there, help me to take this situation and bring calm and peace to this situation. And you can do the same thing. Maybe your daughter has called you, said her husband's a complete loser, and you got to come get her, and he's horrible and shouldn't be anywhere near the kids. Rather than racing over there and saying the first thing that comes to your head, pray and say, God, I'm going over there. I don't know what's happening. Could you help me when I get there? to be calm and to bring peace to the situation. Or maybe it's your son that's called and says the wife's being horrible. So many times, and I'm just mentioning it because I'm a police officer and these are the ones I go to, they're already upset. Parent shows up and gets them riled up even more. No one's bringing calm to the situation. But as a Christian, pray and say, God, help me. Because this is what people need. And I want to encourage you to do this, to be the calm, to bring the peace, People need this. There are not too many peacemakers out, out there. And if you're wondering, I think people are peaceful. Sit at a light, let it turn green, wait two seconds, and we'll see how peaceful people are. You're going to start hearing honk, 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 honk. People aren't peaceful. They need peaceful people. The world does. And this is tough because stirring it up comes natural. People by nature love a good fight. Peacemaking is a God thing. But when you do this, if you determine Jesus brought peace even to the horriblest of situations, God helped me to do that. When you determine to do that and to be that way, you'll 
be the one that everybody hopes shows up when things go bad. When your grandkids are going through some tough times, they'll think if grandma was here, she could help. She would know if grandpa was here or if my uncle was here, he would know what to do. If dad or if mom shows up, it's going to get better. They're even going to tell their friends, just wait. My mom's coming. It's going to get better. That's who we need to be. And I would encourage you to be this way. The world needs Christ. The world needs to see Jesus more than ever now. The world needs genuine Christians that are living like Christ. And to wrap it all up, I want to bring it back to what Bobby's been dealing with. James 2, 14 through 18. So we stay on track. James 2, 14 through 18 says this. What does it profit, Christian? Though a man says he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you simply says with your mouth, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? If you see a need and you don't help with that need, you simply say, I hope everything works out for you. Have you done that per person any good? It's a rhetorical, no, you haven't. Even so, faith, just the same. If it has not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. What he's saying is I'll show you what I believe by the things that I do. So many people in our world are trying to show the world that they're Christians, that God is good, that Jesus is good by showing the world all the things they don't do. I'm a Christian now, I don't do this. I'm a Christian now, I don't do that. And that, that plan is a flawed plan. We're not making the battle damage I think that we're wanting to on the devil because we're all about what we don't do. We need to be positive in the things that we, need to, that we do. We need to show the world who Jesus is and what he was about by being what Jesus was about. The whole New Testament is filled with the works and words of Jesus. And I would encourage you to do those things. Specifically, just what we touched on today. Be a giver. Look for needs. Ask God to show you a need. Meet that need. Be somebody that's encouraging everywhere you go that I'm going to be the one. If everybody's had a bad day, dare they meet me because it's about to go up because that's, that's who Jesus is. And be somebody that everyone hopes shows up when things are bad. Jesus changed the world. He changed me. And we can change the world. The world, my goodness, you watch the news. The world needs to see something different. The world is seeing the exact same thing from the world, and it's seeing the exact same thing from Christians, and it shouldn't be. There should be a distinct difference. And when you show them a distinct difference, I promise they're going to take notice. They're going to say, well, that was oddly different than what everybody else is doing. So what's going on? What's different about you? And you'll have an opportunity to say, I'm simply doing what the person who saved my soul did. And that's be a giver. That's be an encourager. And so if we could have every head bowed and every eye closed, if you guys want to go ahead and stand, Charlotte's going to come and sing a song of invitation. And the altar's open. Uh, maybe you want to pray about something that was uh, mentioned in the service. Maybe you want to pray about something completely different, even if it's... Uh, you, Johnny Touche, you want to pray for him specifically. The altar's open. We're going to give you time to pray, and then we'll be dis dismissed. But I want to pray before she sings. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share from your, wor from your word. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that for all those here, that we would be determined to do something. More, more than just not to do something but to do something, to say, even just one of the things mentioned in your word, that's what I'm gonna work on. That's what I'm gonna do because I want to change the world. I wanna show them something different. I pray that you give us the courage to do that this week in Jesus' name. Weak and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. Oh, rain your head for God is passing by. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and live. Now your birth Okay.
after I say this. You guys are dismissed. I would encourage you. There's, uh, If you did fill out a visitor's card to stick it in the bucket on the way out. If you have an offering, that's what the buckets are for as well. Please leave your chairs. Uh, we're going to go ahead and clean them and get them ready for next week. As you're leaving, listen to the words of the song. I absolutely love the song. It, it talks about all the things that we do all the way up to death for Jesus Christ. And so go ahead and sing that, Charlotte, and you guys are dismissed. Like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to crawl and remember.